So hello, welcome everyone when you are watching this back at whatever point, hopefully at a reasonable hour where you're getting good sleep and not up super late watching Margaret and I have a conversation. This is our second in a Zoom cast series that we are doing here in the MS Counseling Program at Prescott College to introduce you to our amazing and exceptional faculty. Second in our series is Dr. Margaret Carlock Russo. Dr. Carlock Russo is a wonderful EAT provider that we are so, so excited to have here at Prescott. Not only is she a pretty exceptional EAT provider, she also happens to be the current president of ADA, which is the American Association for Art Therapy, correct? American Art Therapy Association, yes. And new, see, new acronyms, nope. We just okay. Don't, we don't get along, okay. So, Margaret, let's start here. Yes. If you could, tell me the story of how you came to be in the mental health field. Oh, absolutely. Um, I often talk about this story to some students and uh, or uh, people who are interested in the field and think that maybe it's too late for them to learn uh, or too late for them to come back into school. So I originally uh, was a Spanish major and a uh, fine arts major. I had double um, double dip there at uh, undergrad. And I really didn't know what direction I wanted to be in, but I knew that I really wanted to incorporate the arts into my career in some way. I, at that time, had not heard about art therapy. So I was really, you know, searching. So I taught for a bit. Um, I taught Spanish for, for a bit. That was my very first job out of uh, college. And um, what I realized then, again, reiterated or, or reaffirmed my need to be more involved in the arts. So through my exploration, I began uh, working at a um, residence, I guess, like back then, it wasn't a nursing home, but that would be the most close equivalent. And I was the um, in the uh, therapeutic recreation area. And I loved it. I loved working with clients, with people. Um, I got to do some art, but I, you know, wasn't satisfied. Cut to about a year or so into that job, inadvertently met someone who came into the department there to just chat with us and had just offhandedly mentioned she was a um, rehab special uh, therapist, rehabilitation therapist. And so she just mentioned this art therapy and I, I stopped in my tracks really and I said, tell me more about that. And so instantly pretty much, I said, I, it just kind of clicked. Okay, this is my love of working with people, my love of art together, I found it. And very, very sh soon after that, I, I located a good program um, in my area and uh, applied for graduate school. And I wasn't, you know, I, I was, um several years out into the field and working so i had it was kind of an adjustment to get back into school but i i don't look back i love it and i've uh really so fortunate to just have that ability to have found out you know from someone else so that was great yeah what a cool yeah. coincidence i it mean was. maybe coincidence isn't the right word for that kind of serendipitous happenstance it, yes yeah, true <laughs> pretty cool it makes for a good backstory it does <laughs> it does yes yeah I, so tell us this what truths were you taught during your own training that have yeah. since either been upheld or overthrown yeah. and how does that inform your current practice clinically well so i'm thinking of two things and uh, I've been in the practicing in the field for over 25 years. So going back into my education was quite a while ago. And um, the one thing that that came to my mind when you just said that was self-disclosure. I was in that group of individuals who was taught never self-disclose, be, you know, kind of uh, neutral and try not to show your emotion and try, you know, just be this very neutral um, uh, uninvolved person, objective person for your clients or groups. And so that's how I was trained. And to the point where like we, students and I, other students and I used to sort of worry a little bit like, oh my gosh, should I say that? Should I not say, you know, like we were just really nervous about it. Uh, luckily, um, my inclination was, is always, and, and maybe students recognize this and colleagues also, I try to be as um, transparent as I can, uh, keeping my boundaries, but I'm, I'm an open person. Um, and so it was really hard. And uh, 
shortly after I graduated, then I got out in the field and, you know, continuing education and workshops and things started changing and I started realizing, ah, uh, it's not that terrible. And there are reasons why you might self-disclose um, that are appropriate, you know? And so when I got into teaching years later, I, that was a big part of my uh, teaching, especially like in internship uh, courses and things like that to really teach students about boundaries around why we self-disclose, who we might, who might benefit, making sure that it's always in, in the uh, interest of the client, not yourself on all those kinds of things. So now I use it a lot in my practice, um, a fair amount, I would say, because I find that it's in certain circumstances, it can really help move a situation for a client or just provide um, a perspective that's different for a client to consider. So I, I do use that now, which is so interesting. And the other thing that, that came to mind was um, that has held true is that um, I, had an, I had faculty who really um, worked very hard to help us understand the power of relationship and um, understanding that really nothing can happen in a therapeutic situation unless there is that ability to create a, uh, a positive, healthy therapeutic relationship. So, um, and, and relational work is kind of, that's how I operate all the time. So that has held true for me. I'm very person-centered in my approach and um, that has just held true throughout my career. So um, that stuck. Yeah. I would agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. I think that's the one thing that consistently sticks for me, right? Is mm -hmm. that if you don't have the therapeutic relationship, it's hard to get anything else done. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well yeah. said. Well said. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So how do you live Prescott's mission of pairing social justice advocacy with environmental stewardship? Yeah, I um hmm, that's an interesting question because I think for me it's a continual process. I when I first came to Prescott, one of the things that really attracted me was, oh, you know, this place that really kind of aligns with my core beliefs and how I, I try to operate in the world. Now, having said that, you know, we're all we are all human and we are not perfect. So I am forever iterating how I do that. Um, I am for, you know, environmentally, I try to do everything I can even in my own home, you know, as far as living green and, and um, being very aware of um, the things that affect the environment that I can have some kind of control over in my, at least in my life. And so I try to contribute in those ways and um, be very mindful of what's going on and try to um, just try to keep um, that, uh, keep the environment in mind. And I also tend to, like, I find a need to be in nature myself. And so I surround myself with things that are um, promoting, you know, um, the natural environment. Uh, and I also use nature to a certain extent in, in some of the therapeutic work that I do with clients, depending where they are. We talk a lot about environment and um, being grounded and, you know, things like that, that, that you can really feel differently when you're in, in nature. So I'm very respectful of that aspect of, of environmental um, concerns. Social justice is also a big part of my inner beliefs and my core beliefs and how I would like to present myself to the world. And that's where a lot, they're both areas are learning uh, processes for me, but in social justice, what I, my focus is more on, um, while of course I'm aware of all of it, but my, my work focus is working with individuals who are often, um, I know lots of people are marginalized, but often overlooked. So I work with lots of older adults, lots of individuals that have are different, you know, have different needs in their lives as far as physical movement or communication and things like that. So I notice social justice in those realms, how accessible things are to all individuals, you know, universal mm -hmm. um, design and accessibility and things like that. So I've, those are the personal causes that I, um, try to align myself with and, and work on. While, of course, in the world that we live in right now, you know, the social justice has suddenly, I mean, it's been there, right? But it's suddenly become more um, accessible, more noticeable to lots of individuals who 
who maybe perhaps weren't that aware of the issues that have been in our country since its inception, right, or since mm -hmm. before its inception. So, yeah. yeah, so those types of things are are also on my mind, and I'm very um, cognizant of them. And I really appreciate working in an environment where that is embraced, and where we can talk openly about, um, you know, racial issues and oppression and uh, various different um, different um, situations that are social justice issues, whether they're political or social or whatever. Um, and I really, I really um, am very happy to be in a place where we can talk about that because I find that still sadly so many places um, that we can work or that we have to, you know, we interact on a daily basis. It's not as easy. It's not as receptive, you know, um, receptive of an environment. So I think, I don't know if that exactly answered your question, but I think it's very much top of my mind and I feel very aligned with Prescott that they, that Prescott really truly holds those values and not, mm -hmm. it's not just words on a page, but they truly hold those values is really meaningful to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, and what you just said, yes, I think that's a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> and I think it brought up another question for me, which mm -hmm. is, Ooh, as someone who does not consider herself overly creative or artistic, right, in the world mm -hmm. of expressive arts, when we think about that experiential and expressive arts community, mm -hmm. how has the kind of social justice reckoning that I think a lot of the world has, mm -hmm. as you're giving voice to, only now had to experience from a very privileged standpoint, right, mm -hmm. because... Um, it is more apparent that this has been the undercurrent that was there all along, that perhaps the privilege shielded mm -hmm. us from having to grapple with, right, mm -hmm. on, a, on a very real level. I'm wondering what parallel um, might be happening in the world of expressive art and expressive art therapy, mm -hmm. and how that might tie into the way you would answer this question for, let's say, students coming in to Prescott. Yeah that are looking at your certification right, in EAT. Right. Yeah, you know, I so appreciate that question because I think you are really keying into something that is phenomenal that has been happening within, you know, my particular profession, which is art therapy, expressive arts therapy, various other creative arts therapies, is that, and, and this has been somewhat publicized um, in the media uh, over the last couple of years, but given, COVID, given the um, racial uh, disparities that are that are really being, uh, you know, uncovered for lots of people, not that they didn't exist, but just really in the presence of society right now with all the violence that's been happening and different things all at once and the protest and everything else, people had naturally been called to create something. And um, there's some research happening around this and some diff I just heard a couple of presentations this last weekend about um, the use of art making during um, these events. And so what's, what is happening is that because of that natural instinct, like let's face it, we are all creative beings. I believe that firmly. We create in different ways, but we have that human need to make um, ourselves known, make our thoughts known, share with the world, um, memorialize things in different ways, right? So art, uh, look, think of cave paintings. That's how I kind of start my foundational course with cave paintings. I mean, you know, in, in time immemorial, human beings have uh, made their marks in some way or another. So I say that because that when when you're in upheaval, when you're uncertain, when you don't know what's going on and you really have trouble putting words to it, I mean, you know, uh, it, just, just for example, let's take the pandemic is was extremely unknown situation for the vast majority of individuals that are living now, right? Because in our lifetimes, this has never happened before. And so that level of unrest and uncertainty and worry 
just really spontaneously sparked in individuals. Uh, how can whether it was for self soothing or whether it was for messaging, whatever. So they uh, naturally gravitated towards art making. What what happened is that it kind of um, helped our professions. Um, gain more credibility suddenly, very quickly, like, oh, well, I'm doing this on my own, but I think I need a little more help. Let me go find who can help me with this. I need a professional, you know, those kinds of things um, had happened. And also with media and also with, um, you know, um, uh, crisis intervention and things like that. that we were finding that that um, art therapists, expressive arts therapists, all these different creative people have been called upon uh, to help and to provide some, whether it was services, not necessarily, maybe, or maybe just understanding, or maybe just um, methods to, I did a lot of this early on in interviews and blog posts and things like that about what can I, you know, answering that question, what can I do at home for myself if I can't get to, or I don't really think I need yet a mental health pr professional, but I need something to help me relieve stress or to help me calm down or to help me, you know, um, just, uh, you know, deal with my mood fluctuation or whatever it might be. So I was, um, while it wasn't art therapy, I was giving certain tasks for people to do suggestions on their own to kind of self-soothe and self-manage um, a little bit better. So the reason I go into all this detail is because I think that what you've hit upon is what we're recognizing now is that suddenly um, another big thing that happened was telehealth. So we quickly pivoted Art therapists never really imagined themselves doing telehealth because where's the media? How do I manage this? You know, et cetera. But we had to, right? We did it. And now we're finding how, oh, yes, this is a good platform. We have ways of managing this. Those kinds of things came in tandem with uh, the federal government, state governments, relaxing their regulations for telehealth, relaxing their regulations for um, who can practice, who, you know, because art therapy and expressive arts therapy are still in some places in the country, um, not licensed individually, right? So people are, um, in, you know, uh, that's a whole nother discussion I could talk about is where they are licensed and how you can practice if you're not and all that. They can practice, but a lot of times aren't recognized by insurance companies and things like that because they don't have that license from the state. So um, that was relaxed as well. And now there's like, because of the relaxation, people are now educated more about what's possible and how effective this can be. So it's kind of this circle that's developing and now people want more of the creative arts therapies. And so there's more of a push toward um, allowing that to happen, uh, finding opportunities for us, even some states granting licensing a little easier than it had been in the past, which is exciting in this climate, et cetera. So I think long-winded answer to your question is that um, this is a really dynamic time for expressive arts therapies. Um, absolutely. Uh, we are be, in tandem with that. We are having lots of research that's coming out that's very empirically based. There's a ton of stuff happening in the last year or two. It has been happening for a while, but really new studies linking neuroscience and the creative arts and finding ways to show in brain function how the arts are helping a particularly in trauma, particularly, you know, with, with people that I work with who have dementia and things like that. Um, so those all those things together are creating this amazing space where where I feel like there's going to be an explosion of, uh, you know, possibilities for us in, in the future, um, and in almost now, but really in the future, building tremendously. So I'm very excited about um, what's been going on in ways that we can now bring in a different method for people who need mental health services, right? Yeah, so it's the time is right, finally. <laughs> so get in here and get your certifications. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes, yes. If you look at all the all the statistics, this is a growing field, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's wonderful. And it's, uh, there are tons of possibilities for uh, another burgeoning area, you know, like when I say these things, I mean, different art therapists, different expressive arts artists have been working in community for, for decades, 
-hmm. but in very small and kind of like um, separated ways. Now mm -hmm. there's a much bigger push for community art therapy and community, mm -hmm. you know, and working with um, agencies that are dealing with what's happening in the world now and becoming mm -hmm. on the, the front line of that. So it's, it's really exciting to be able to help in that way. Yeah. That's awesome, Margaret. Thank you. Sure, sure. So last question for us, and mm -hmm. then just for our, our viewers that are watching this back, in our first one, you will have noticed that we are not going to do a role play in this one because we thought it would be better after this next question to end our time with Margaret so that she can also give us some examples mm -hmm. of what gets created in a typical EAT session mm -hmm. with a client. Mm -hmm. So it will absolutely not be an original work by a client. We wouldn't share anything in terms of confidentiality purposes, mm -hmm. but Margaret has been so kind to offer of her own pieces mm -hmm. so that we can really see the types of things that she's creating mm -hmm. on her end in work with others. So we're hopeful that that will be something really interesting for you and pique your interest. So if you're wondering, huh, this seems like a format change, like why no demonstration? Because we wanted you to see it in real time. Yeah. So last, but certainly not least, sure. and gosh, now I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe I am a little creative because there are some self-care things that I do for myself that might fall into this line. Um, mm -hmm. But I'd be interested to know how you define self-care and what your personal practice looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that also. And uh, before I answer that, I will acknowledge that, yes, you think think broadly to everyone, think broadly about how you are creative in the world, whether you are interested in makeup or gardening or fashion or cooking or, you know, et cetera. It does not have to simply be drawing. And then also reminding everyone that in the expressive arts, we focus much more on the process and how it feels to create, the messages that come out when we create, rather than the aesthetic quality. Although sometimes that is important to an individual, that is not our overall focus, it's not the aesthetics. So we welcome anyone. And in fact, sometimes people who are less um, well-versed in creating in the arts are easier it's easier for them to get engaged than it is for people who have been trained as fine artists because they get stuck in that releasing their you know worry about skill and perspective and all that uh, and just creating I wouldn't have thought of that yeah right? almost like that perfectionism <laughs> showing up as an artist mm -hmm. and almost blocking the process sometimes huh. sometimes yes yes yeah okay. I've seen that with students too and I've had to work really hard with them to kind of just just focus on the process and don't worry about what it looks like and they find it very releasing when they can but it's just a hard shift because you've been so so trained to yeah. look at it aesthetically you know so yeah. wow Margaret I feel like maybe that's like the self-care tip of the day is like <laughs> if we could apply that broadly right right if right you can focus on the process rather than mm -hmm. the product how different yeah. our day-to-day -day would look yes absolutely absolutely I, yeah. I mean and I try I I'm not saying I'm perfect at it at all but part of my self-care is just that I talk a lot about for myself about self-compassion and patience and um, I tend to have a perfectionistic edge so I'm constantly trying to be like you know you do as much as you can and that's okay. Um, but each, what I, I alluded to before is I really love to be in nature. Um, I made the move from New York, not that it doesn't have beautiful nature too, but um, to Arizona about six years ago. And my engagement with the world around me has just amplified so much. So every day, every day, I am either uh, walking or biking or um, some, um, well, my biking, to be honest, is stationary because <laughs> So that doesn't count, but I'm outside, um, but my walking in nature, and I have a practice of noticing when I walk. Um, so I try to, sometimes I'll, you know, have pictures, I put them on my Instagram or whatever, um, but most of the time it's just for me. I notice if it's something really interesting, and so then I'll, you know, um, share it with others, but I just like to notice the little things that are uh, often bypassed, often, you know, so rote in our lives that we don't look at really how amazing it is or how beautiful it is. And so, and it can be anything. Um, 
I have a dog, so I walk with my dog lots of places, and she helps me too notice those things because she's always interested in, you know, what's down there, what's going on, you know. And there's so much, you know, people think the desert is barren and boring and bunch of dirt, you know, but I have seen so many species of insects or fauna, flora, all kinds of um, amazing things that I never really saw before because it's different than what I would see on the East Coast. So I put myself in that every day, every day. And for health, I'm walking, you know, about an hour or so every day in the morning. And then I also practice, um, right now I'm very into pottery. So every week I have to make sure that I make it to my pottery studio, not my personal studio, but there's a community studio. So it offers me a community connection and it also offers me an, an opportunity to just, you know, let everything go and be in my process with my clay and, you know, just kind of whatever comes out that was that's good. Sometimes I produce things, sometimes it's just kind of fooling around with the clay or working out energy, but I do that every week. I also do some other types of art photography and um, occasionally I do, um, I'd like to do more to be honest, but occasionally I do pastel work. That's a big focus of mine. So I always do those things and always make sure that I have connections with family and friends. Um, yeah, those are my primary steady there's always some breathing and meditation types of things that happen, um, but that's my steady practice. And then, then I think it's also important to make time to, you know, have adventures and go just go to different places, take in new things. Um, I'm very interested in cultures and uh, just learning about how people live in the world, and you know, not trying to always widen my perspective. So that to me is very nourishing. And so I try as much as possible to get into those, um, give myself those opportunities as well. So that's my self-care. Oh, you just came up with like the best um, tagline or byline if you oh. were a journalist, I think. Dr. Margaret Carlock Rousseau, get into the adventure. Oh, there you go. Okay. That fits me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I liked it. <laughs> thank oh, you. Margaret, thank listen, you. Just thank you so much for your time. I think absolutely students that are either in our programs or are looking at our programs are going to have a much better idea of yeah. what the world of an art therapist looks like mm -hmm. and what our programs might look like, what drew you into this field. Mm -hmm. I think the piece that I'm walking away with is just even in that last example of going to a pottery studio and literally working through the energy that's presenting rather than trying to create a thing. Yes. Even that is pretty freeing of just thinking about just the process of working through that or whatever's coming up in that moment mm -hmm. versus a product having to be there at the end of the day. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty cool. So thank you for that gift oh, for sure. My pleasure. Okay, and we will be looking forward to seeing some examples of what EAT looks like in practice. Okay. Can, can I put a personal bin in? I'd love to see a pottery piece now. Oh, sure. Yes, that's it. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, I will definitely yeah. include some. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, everyone, we'll stay tuned. Up next, we're going to be talking with Dr. Maury Lung, who is the head of our EA, EAT. No, nope, that's what we're doing right now. <laughs> ABC, NBC, our adventure-based counseling and nature-based counseling in our next series. So thank you again, Dr. Margaret Carlock Russo for your time. And yeah, look You're forward to seeing welcome. your examples. Very welcome. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.